right into the mic and project so right. that people can. I think it's all it's set to be like for a minute and then it switches on to the next one. I, it should be. Okay. If not, they get one picture. <laughs> okay, great. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, my blind dog is in the audience and he might bark, so I apologize. He is vegan, so please forgive him. Uh, my name is Simone Reyes, and I'm an animal rights activist. Part of the job of an activist is to ask the tough questions, which is what I decided to do here today. The seed promotes a plant-based diet, so I assume that we have some vegans in the house. Um, but I also imagine that we have some that aren't quite yet vegan. And maybe we have some vegans that aren't living a total vegan lifestyle. Maybe some of you came to veganism because you heard that Beyonce and Jay-Z did it for 22 days. <laughs> Let's hope not. Um, maybe some of you came to veganism because your doctor told you that it was the best way to save your life. Maybe some of you are vegan activists. Maybe some of you identify as feminists or human rights activists, LGBT activists, environmentalists. I welcome you all, and I hope that after this talk that you can at least come to an understanding about activism and the vital role that veganism and animal rights has in the big picture of changing the world. And when I say changing the world, you can bank on the fact that I'm not going to stop trying to change the world until we achieve a state of no excuses and no compromises, total animal liberation. It is my goal to make certain that as the tide turns, ushering in a new wave of acceptance and tolerance and justice and freedom for humans that no animals are left behind. I often ask groups of people to raise their hands and say, who here loves animals? And everybody proudly does. And I say, who here loves dogs? And then everybody raises their hands. And then I say, well, who here refuses to breed their dog? And some of the hands go down. And I say, well, who here loves their cat? And everybody's like, yes, I love my cat. And I say, well, who here refuses to declaw your cat? And I lose a couple more. And I say, who here loves rabbits? And most people raise their hands because they think that they love rabbits. And I say, well, then who here checks their cosmetic labels and makes sure that none of their cosmetics or their soaps or their detergents are tested on animals? Who here loves farm animals? 
And then who here refuses to eat meat or dairy from farm animals? Who here loves cows? Everybody raises their hand. Who doesn't love a smiling cow? But then who here refuses to wear leather shoes? Who here loves sheep? Who here doesn't wear wool coats? Who here loves dolphins? Who here refuses to go to SeaWorld and refuses to swim with captive dolphins? Who here loves furry animals? Most people say yes, and then I say, oh yeah, what about rats? And what about mice? And people sort of look away and look a little embarrassed. And then I say, well, who here considers themselves a responsible citizen of the world with extended compassion for all its inhabitants, even though some of them might be melting on your pizza or sprinkling in a little bit of extra flavor in bacon bits for your salad? I've even had to ask some vegans, who here loves bees? Those are the ones that eat honey. And I'm like, no, look it up in the dictionary. Vegans do not eat honey. And I finish by asking, who here loves all animals? And the real answer in the room, typically, is people don't love all animals. They love some animals. And that's what it is, which is OK unless they're contributing to the pain and suffering of the animals that they don't consider. And believing in that is called speciesism. And believing that you can be an activist for any social justice cause without recognizing the shift to a vegan lifestyle is called hypocrisy. This will be as frowned upon one day as being a racist or a sexist or a homophobe. Activists on the front lines of many of these struggles fight these words every day. Nobody wants to be called these things. I mean, they're ugly words, right? They're shameful words. These are the prejudices that activists battle every day in many social justice movements, and yet, when it comes to animals, there's often an unmistakable disconnect. And this is personal to me because I've been to one too many fundraisers where we donate our hard-earned money toward helping the environment while being served a juicy steak. And I've been to one too many protests for equality while people sip their dairy lattes. And I've been to one too many marches to end world hunger while people are marching wearing leather shoes. And I've been to one too many pride parades where live animals are made to endure the hot summer heat dressed up like dolls because they look cute in a costume. So, I have taken it, popular or unpopular, as my mission to call out these groups, and not in any way to slam them, because fighting for important causes, social justice issues, no matter what they are, should be applauded and should be respected and appreciated. But I feel that there has come a time to wake them up and to reconnect this disconnect and invite them to join us, the animal rights movement, because it's only together that we can save the world, save the planet, and save ourselves. I march with Mercy for Animals every year at Pride, and we carry a banner, and it says, no one is free while others are oppressed. This is the lesson that we must all learn. The connection between social justice movements and animals has historically been fought hand in hand. However, in recent years, it's been seemingly going in the wrong direction. History books have many images of the suffrages standing with the workers and the civil rights activists and the anti-vivisection activists. And yet today, we have groups working independently and yes, hypocritically. Simply stated, if you call yourself an environmentalist and you are not vegan, you are a hypocrite. It is simply impossible to identify an environmental activist if they're not vegan. You cannot ignore the glaring fact that factory farming for food consumption constitutes a frontal assault on the environment of epic proportions. Global warming is a growing, life-threatening threat that we cannot deny, and it is the number one cause of factory farming deaths in this world that will happen because of global warming. Industrialized animal agriculture contributes to an estimated 51% of greenhouse gases worldwide. This is more than planes, trains, and automobiles combined. 
raising animals for food now uses a staggering 30% of the Earth's land masses. More than 260 million acres of U.S. forests have been cleared to create cropland to grow grain to feed farm animals. Seven football fields worth of land is bulldozed every minute to create more room for farm animals. Of all the agricultural land in the U.S., 80%, if you can even imagine, 80% is used to raise animals for food and grow the grain to feed them. That's almost half the total land mass of the lower 48 states. Every six seconds, an acre of the rainforest is cut down for cattle farming. That's 14,400 acres a day. The nitrogen from animal feces and from fertilizer, which is primarily used to grow crops for farmed animals, causes algae populations to skyrocket, leaving little oxygen for other life forms. Livestock grazing is the number one reason that plant species in the United States becomes threatened and goes extinct eventually. And it also leads to soil erosion and eventual desertification that renders non-fertile land barren. While factory farms are ruining our land, commercial fishing methods such as bottom trawling and long lining have virtually emptied millions of square miles of ocean and pushed many marine species to the brink of extinction. Male fish are now growing ovaries. And that is suspected to be a deformity because of factory farm runoff from drug-laden chicken feces. And the result of consuming all of this, obesity, diabetes, certain cancers, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart disease, impotence, and the list goes on and on. And as Captain Paul Watson of Sea Shepherd has said, if the oceans die, we die. And make no mistake, our oceans are dying. Tree huggers, I am talking to you. Many of us are convinced that the next world war will not be over oil, it will be over water. Already a billion people, or one in seven people, on this planet lack access to safe drinking water. 70% of the world's usable water is consumed in agriculture, growing and raising our food. Government intelligence, and this is scary, it scared me when I read it, as water shortages become more acute beyond the next 10 years, water in shared basins will increasingly be used as leverage. The use of water as a weapon or to further terrorist objectives will become more likely beyond 10 years. And for those of you who are taking one for the team and shutting off your water while you lather and shutting off your lights on timers and recycling and sharing with friends, bless you. That is amazing, but unless you live a vegan lifestyle, please do not try to call yourself an environmentalist. And to the global hunger activists, I offer you this. If you aren't vegan, you too, I'm sorry, are a hypocrite. Because it takes more than 11 times as much fossil fuel to make one calorie of animal protein as it does to make one calorie from plant protein. It takes more than 24 gallons of water to produce one pound of meat, while growing one pound of wheat only requires 25 gallons. You save more water by not eating a pound of meat than you do by not showering for six months. The math simply doesn't add up unless you go vegan. Even the United Nations has begged people to make a shift toward a vegetarian or vegan diet. We can feed the world if we go vegan. And to the anti-pollution activists, I say this. Studies have shown that animal waste lagoons emit toxic airborne chemicals that cause inflammatory, immune, and neurochemical problems in humans. What do we get back from all the grain and the fossil fuels and water that go into making animal products? Tons and tons of feces, of course. According to the EPA, the runoff from factory farms pollutes our waterways more than all of the industrial sources combined. 
And when the cesspools holding the tons of urine and the feces get full, guess what they do? In order to circumvent the water pollution limits, they just spray liquid manure all into the air, creating these mists that come back into our lungs. This is what we are inhaling. Worse, of course, for people that live right next to the factory farms, similar to the Aaron Brockovich movie. Factory farms produce massive amounts of dust and other contaminants that pollute the air. A study in Texas found that animal feedlots in that state produce more than 7,000 tons of particulate dust every year. And that dust contains biologically active organisms like bacteria and mold and fungi from the feces in the feed. And 80% of ammonia, by the way, emissions in the US come from what else? Animal waste. So that's what I say about environmentalism. There's a lot more research that you can do online. But now we have to talk about the other social justice movements. And I have to talk to the feminists. Women, I challenge you here and now, if you call yourself a feminist and you are not living a vegan lifestyle, I am sorry to use the word, but yes, you are a hypocrite. If women are offended by being called a piece of meat, then why, shouldn't they, be, why should they be ingesting the carcass of an animal that has never been viewed as anything but that, despite him or her having had a life, certainly a painful and lonely one, but a life where she had the same longings, the same desire for freedom, the same loneliness that we do. And if as women we're against being exploited, how is it acceptable to exploit animals? Patriarchy is a gender system that is implicit in animal-human relationships. The women's movement has been fighting a patriarchal society that routinely tries to deny women contraception, paid by, by, by our insurance, take away a woman's right to choose, forcing motherhood on women. But what is it that is happening to female cows every day in factory farms? They are being routinely given no choice but to be artificially inseminated, forcing motherhood onto her and then cruelly robbing her of even that, giving her no opportunity to bond with her baby, giving her no opportunity to meet them. All she does is wail day in and day out after her, constantly. Undercover investigators have said that the cry of a female cow that after having her baby taken away haunts them to this day. If women are fighting against rape and other violent crimes against women, how can we be okay with rape racks? And by the way, we didn't come up with this terminology. Farmers did. That is what they keep female cows on. So women, do you really need that piece of cheese on your cracker when we know that it is a direct product of a rape rack? I don't think so and female reproductive cycles are abused to benefit humans. Battery cage hens are confined in tiny cages, crammed together the size of a rolled up newspaper, forced to produce eggs beyond what is natural for them, and then they're sent to slaughter when their bodies give out. The patriarchal cultures that fuel an insatiable need to dominate and have power over women are guilty of the same thing that many women are doing to animals. Women have even been called the same derogatory names as animals, pig, sow, bitch, beaver. Feminists are opposed to forcing women into prostitution, but what are purebred pet shops and puppy mills for companion animals? They're bred, they're sold. Isn't a breeder simply a pimp? There's no such thing as responsible breeding. When shelters are taking in six to seven million animals a year, and three to four million are never making it out alive. Battered women, they are traumatized and beaten and raped and held hostage under patriarchy. Just as our undercover investigations at PETA, Mercy for Animals, Farm Sanctuary and others have revealed, so are animals in laboratories, on fur farms, and on factory farms. And what is the sexist? If not someone who demeans and objectifies women, in our society, we so objectify animals that we don't even call their body parts what they are. We'll say a leg of lamb, not a lamb's leg. Meat is a hamburger instead of cow's flesh. A nugget 
is a chicken, but we call it a nugget to disassociate. The list goes on and on. Animals are routinely treated as objects and regarded as such. Women fight to be seen as equal, not less than, but who are considered less than than animals themselves. And to the anti-slave trade and trafficking activists, I challenge you to make the connection. We traffic in animals literally whenever we eat an animal, whenever we purchase a leather belt, whenever we wear a fur coat, whenever we go out into the ocean and kidnap dolphins, shipping them in slings to perform degrading and cruel animal acts in abusement parks. I flew to Japan last year, and I saw it with my own eyes. I saw the cove run red with the blood of hundreds of dolphins that were fighting for their lives, mothers surrounding their babies and trying desperately to not have them taken. But they were, and that is because we have to get stronger. We have to fight this harder. The same ideology that allows slavery in the form of sex trafficking, forced or bonded labor, forced marriage, sweatshop jobs, child slavery, they all go hand in hand with what animals have to endure at the hands of humans. The transport of slaves accepted a huge mortality rate in the passages to America as natural wastage, but farm animals continue to be shipped to slaughter in such heinous conditions that many never make it to their final slaughter destination still alive. Their last days are spent just like all of their other days, in terror, injured, suffocated, exposed to all of the elements. In zoos and performing circuses, animals are routinely burned and electrocuted, whipped, beaten, terrorized so that they can balance a ball on their head or contort their bodies into unnatural positions, performing tricks for food. If this isn't modern day slavery, then I don't know what is. A move to a vegan lifestyle would stop this. Activists who advocate for organic farming, that's great. We should be advocating for organic farming of fruits and vegetables. We should be fighting GMOs. We should be fighting at least for labeling of GMOs. But pro-organic activists that think they're doing the animals any favors by buying grass-fed or free-range, think again. Free-range is a lie. Just look at the undercover investigations, look at the video. Nothing can change what the truth is. Thousands upon thousands are shoved into filthy sheds to maximize profits, cramming them together. Cattle are dehorned, hens have their beaks cut off, chicks and calves that happen to be born male are still killed and ground up and suffocated almost immediately after birth. That is what happens in our egg industry. And the same slaughterhouses, by the way, that kill animals from factory farms are the same slaughterhouses that kill the organic and free-range animals that we think we're doing such a great thing by purchasing. There is no such thing as humane meat, and there is no such thing as humane slaughter. The animals' deaths are identically as horrific. They are hung upside down with their throats slit, often still conscious as they go into the defeathering tanks with scalding hot water still alive. Then we have to also talk about anti-war activists. I'm sure many of us here in the room are against war. And it's important to get out on the streets and to protest. War is destructive to men, women, and children. But do you think that non-humans are spared in any way? Here's just one report from 1945, Allied bombers, when they laid siege to the German city of Dresden. Within the target zone was the Dresden Zoo, which was described as this. The elephants gave spine-chilling screams. Their house was still standing, but an explosive bomb of terrible force landed behind it, lifting the, the dome of the house, turned it around and put it back on again. The baby elephant was lying in a narrow barrier moat on her back with her legs up to the sky. She had suffered severe stomach injuries and could not move. Three hippopotamuses were drowned when iron debris pinned them to the bottom of their water basin. In the ape house, a gibbon reached out to her handler, but she had no hands, only stumps. 
Nearly 40 monkeys escaped to the trees, but were dead the next day from drinking water polluted by bomb-making chemicals. And those animals that made it through the first horrific day of that war, the next day was far from over. An aircraft pilot came in low, and he shot everything that moved. Shortly after the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq commenced, looters had emptied Baghdad Zoo of all of its animals. Monkeys, bears, horses, birds, and camels disappeared, carted off by thieves or simply left to die. Even after the U.S.-Iraqi invasion, shoulders were seen shooting a tiger in the head. The reports are numerous and equally as horrendous. And as Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy noted, as long as there are slaughterhouses, there will be battlefields. Violence is violence. It knows no discrimination when it comes to pain and suffering. If you are an LGBT activist and exclude animal rights from your agenda, yes, you are a hypocrite. As LGBT activists, how can we fight to end oppression and bullying by targeting hurtful words from individuals or in the media? When this is commonplace for animals every day on factory farms and circuses and in aquariums, injustice is injustice. If we are against organized hate groups, how can we continue to ignore that we as humans justify the worst abuses on animals just because we can? How can we fight for minorities who are silenced by the powers that be, bullied for being different, be okay with lab animals whose needs are the most silenced, who have no laws protecting them? from enduring lives of deprivation and isolation, misery, who are routinely burned and blinded and shocked, poisoned, isolated, starved, drowned, addicted to drugs, given diseases they would never normally contract, and brain damaged without any painkillers. No experiment, by the way. No surgery, no implantation of electrodes into their skulls, no procedure that cuts them open or off limits in laboratories. If this isn't bully behavior in the most aggressive terms, I don't know what is. Who is a greater bully than humankind? Circus trainers who whip and terrorize wild animals, hunters who go and chase after unarmed animals in their natural habitats on foot or by helicopter, calling it a sport, or just those who drug horses to fix races. They are considered just dumb animals, referred to by serial numbers tattooed onto their flesh and tags stapled onto their ears. They are insignificant. They have no voice. They have no choice. They have no rights. They are regarded as nothing. If you self-identify as a human rights activist and are not living a vegan lifestyle, of course, yes, you too are a hypocrite. Becoming vegan doesn't require that you stop advocating for abused children or battered women or be against any war or any other human rights causes. All exploitation is a manifestation of violence. All discrimination is a manifestation of violence. As long as we allow violence of any sort, there will be violence of every sort. If we want to live in peace, we must act in a peaceful manner to all that share this earth with us. Humans aren't the only species that live here. We just act as if we are. So if you believe that you are a progressive, you simply must consider the plight of animals or else you can call yourself a regressive. All social justice movements, including health and medical, population control, employment, forestry, consumer, anti-GMO, conservationist, animal welfare, political, corporate, etc., they are all connected to the struggle for animal liberation. In his book, Animal Liberation, Peter Singer states that the basic principle of equality does not require equal or identical treatment. It requires equal consideration. This is an important distinction when talking about animal rights. How can we deny the right to live lives free from exploitation and pain? Jeremy Benham once said, the question is not can they reason, nor can they talk, but can they suffer? 
So what more do you need to know for the voice of your conscience to tell you that animals deserve our consideration? How can any activist stand behind the, con the concept that inflicting pain is acceptable? How is it okay to lock up animals and deprive them of everything natural to them, driving them to insanity and self-mutilation from loneliness? If we as activists are striving for a better, kinder world, how can we possibly continue to view animals only in terms of how useful they are to us? How dare we? Peter founder Ingrid Newkirk said, when it comes to pain and love and joy and loneliness and fear, a rat is a pig, is a dog, is a boy. Each one values his or her life and fights the knife. All tremble before death. Only prejudice allows us to deny others the rights that we expect for ourselves. Thankfully, many leading organizations such as the National Audubon Society, the World Watch Institute, the Sierra Club, the Union of Concerned Scientists, and even Al Gore's Live Earth have finally recognized that raising animals for food damages the environment more than just about anything else that we do. This is a great, huge step in the right direction. Many health organizations, of course, are also promoting a vegan diet. So in wrapping up, we are an imperfect society with the promise of greatness. Remember, there was a day when slave owners could not envision a day when there would be free slaves. And there were women at home with their husbands who could not imagine that one day they would be able to own property in their name and could not imagine that they'd be able to vote in a president. One time, a long time ago, you could beat your dog to death and it was 100% legal, no problem there. But now, it's a felony in all 50 states to abuse an animal. Dolphins have been granted non-human personhood in India. Cosmetics testing has been banned in India. You can't beat an elephant with a bullhook in California. You cannot buy a fur coat or a purebred animal or declaw your cat in West Hollywood. Gestation crates are being phased out due to the relentless pressure of animal rights organizations. After PETA offered Egypt simulators, the country ended all use of animals for medical trauma training. Hound hunting of bears and bobcats in California is now illegal. After intensive campaigning by PETA, the US military ended the use of monkeys in the Army's cruel chemical attack training courses. And the release of blackfish, the release of blackfish has SeaWorld on its knees. And that is because of a changing tide. The European Union has banned cosmetic testing and bans the sale and the import of seal products. And right here in the greatest city on earth, our mayor is doing everything that he can to try to retire the abused carriage horses and retire them for good. And Farm Sanctuary has been reminding the public in its campaign that animals are someone, not something, a concept that is taking flight with the spread of veganism in mainstream media. But we, the animal rights movement, are we perfect? We want everybody to include us? In some ways we are, we're extremely evolved, we get the connection, but sometimes we don't go outside of our neighborhoods or our comfort zones enough. We don't align ourselves with other groups enough. Let's face it, our own vegan potlucks and our fests, they aren't gonna cause the revolution that we need. The suffrages weren't at home having bake sales to earn their right to vote. So we need to galvanize we need to have the same mindset as Occupy. We need to do more civil disobedience. I got arrested when the uh, Rose Parade came to town in Los Angeles. There was 19 of us, PETA activists. We stopped that float on three different occasions. We spent six hours in jail. We paid some fines and we hit almost every major media outlet in the country. Civil disobedience works. If you look at any other social justice movement, in the words of Martin Luther King, it is known that this works. Take to the streets. If you believe in animal rights, be relentless, be loud, and never forgive 
anyone that thinks it's okay to abuse an animal. Nobody sets out to be a hypocrite, and certainly not activists for many social justice movements. We are the game changers, we are the whistleblowers, and we are the doers. We occupy, we protest, we get arrested, we are relentless, and we are generous. We don't just wait around and hope and pray for change, we make it happen. And I'm not just talking about the animal rights movement, I'm talking about every activist that fights for every social justice cause. I have faith that every social justice movement will sign the hypocrite no more pledge and take a giant leap into the future so that we can all breathe cleaner air, see our future generations thrive, live longer, be healthier, slay prejudice, stop bullying, end racism, erase sexism, obliterate homophobia, and fight for the rights of the underserved, whether they have human skin or fur or scales or feathers. I see a future for animals to be a bright one, where every sentient being stands in solidarity together. You may say that I am a dreamer, but I am not the only one. I hope someday you will join us and the world will live as one until every cage is empty and every tank is drained. Thank you.